It is now my pleasure to start off our 2021 Genetics Summit with our first presentation entitled Gene Therapy, History, Current State, and Looking to the Future, presented by Dr. Brendan Lee, Professor and Chairman, Baylor College of Medicine, Department of Molecular and Human Genetics. His full bio can be referenced on the attendee website. Dr. Lee, you may now start your presentation and thank you in advance for your attendance today. Well, thank you, Janet. And thank you for the network for this invitation. You guys do such important work and I'm delighted to be here with you. Let me share my screen. So um, again, thank you for um, this invitation. I'm really delighted to um, talk to you about gene therapy. This is a area of uh, great passion uh, of mine. Um, I've been working in this area since I was a trainee and a fellow 30 years ago. And it's, um, it's been, I would say, a journey of great promise. Um, but finally, I think the promises are beginning to be delivered. So when you think about the topic that we all um, are you know, passionate about, that is rare disease, uh, many of which are genetic, um, we know that there are over 30 million Americans with over 7,000 rare diseases. And 80% of them are often genetic in nature. And, there, and this is probably outdated. There are over 500 medicines in development, but still a minority of these rare genetic diseases uh, which have treatments. But as all of you know, things like the Orphan Drug Act really have accelerated the development of these diseases as well as um, investment by NIH and now uh, again, industry. Having said that, and this is something that uh, access is a, a big issue, we need to be alert that this is a, a growing uh, part of health expenditure. So, an important element to consider. When we think about drug development, gene therapy is really just one type of the many, many types of drugs that we deal with in development. And as many of you know, this process includes preclinical, where we study cells and animal models to identify a target. Generically, we identify the lead. It can be a compound or a gene therapy. We have to optimize that lead. Um, we have to determine whether that treatment works in those animal models. And importantly, what are the toxicities associated with it, especially in animal models? And then of course we move forward into clinical testing. And it is the same for gene therapy. Phase one, which is toxicity. Phase two, to find the right dose. Phase three, is it effective? I.e. the pivotal trial. And oftentimes phase four, post-approval, to really study it long-term. When you think about all the therapies that have been developed, not just gene therapies, but it's important to think about this to put gene therapy in the right arena. Clearly, the, the one that has always been the focus for many, many diseases, not just rare, are small molecules, you know, the drugs that we take every day in a pill. But especially in rare diseases, protein therapies, the delivery of proteins, first exemplified by enzyme replacement therapy, came to the forefront, studied in the 70s, and really becoming a real reality in the 80s and 90s. Um, proteins like antibodies also, we hear a lot about antibody therapies. That's an example of a protein therapy. Uh, and then of course, gene therapy. And the promise of gene therapy, of course, is that it could potentially um, fix the underlying problem, though that's not always necessarily the only approach for gene therapy. And there are many types of gene therapies. We hear about viral gene therapy, where we use viruses to deliver the information that we're talking about, or we hear about non-viral gene therapy. And that basically means that we don't use a virus, but we use the actual material, which can be a nucleic acid like DNA or RNA um, to deliver it. And then increasingly, I, I add gene editing because this has captured um, really a lot of excitement. Um, it's not really viral or non-viral, it could be either way but really an approach to truly deliver on fixing the underlying problem. And importantly, not to forget stem cell therapy, because oftentimes gene therapy and stem cell therapy can be combined and is also rel relevant and effective. So when you think about broadly, what do we want to do with gene therapy, the goal? Well, in many situations, it's to replace what's missing. If the gene is mutated in a genetic disease and we have a missing protein, well, it's to deliver, quote, the wild type, quote, or normal gene in its place. It may be to eliminate a protein. Sometimes you have a genetic disease where you accumulate a toxic substance. And then in that case, we may actually try to eliminate it with the gene therapy. And the ultimate goal, of course, 
is to correct it. Can you actually go into the genome, deliver the machinery to actually fix the mutation? And that, of course, is the, the really the best approach, albeit most challenging. Now, the question then is how? And I would say the, 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 the vehicle that has been used most in gene therapy have been viruses. So for example, adeno-associated viruses is a very commonly used virus. Um, and in fact, it's now FDA approved in the context of gene therapy for a, a form of retinitis pigmentosa, as well as spinal muscular atrophy. Very exciting. I was actually on the FDA advisory committee that recommended the approval of the first in vivo gene therapy for an inherited disease, which was this form of RP, um, which is a landmark that occurred several years ago. Now, adenoviruses, a common covirus, has been used for a lot of gene therapy, especially in the context of cancer. And of course, cancers can be rare diseases also. Um, another type, oncoretroviruses, the kind of retroviruses that the HIV virus is part of, can actually be very efficient in infecting blood cells and has been used and studied in especially genetic diseases of the blood, such as immunodeficiencies, like severe combined immunodeficiency or skin. Of course, there are non-viral gene therapies. This includes DNA and RNA. And of course, all of us have already experienced it. Because when you think about the COVID vaccine, it is RNA that has been injected into our arm. So in a way, here you have a pandemic and a common disease. In fact, it's been a form of gene therapy, RNA therapy that has been used to vaccinate all of us. So it really is commonplace when you think about it. The most important thing to, th to consider really, it's, it's like real estate. I grew up in New York. And so you can imagine I was early on fixated, fixated on real estate. And it's, it's location, location, location. And we want to think about delivering a gene therapy. You want to think about what are you delivering it to? Is it to the bloodstream systemically or is it locally? And if it's locally, is it to the organ, the tissue, or maybe even to cells? Where are you doing this? Ex vivo, are you collecting the cells, infecting them or delivering the gene therapy outside of the body and putting it back in? Or is it in vivo, like in the AAV gene therapy with spinal muscular atrophy or with RP, where you're injecting the, the gene therapy of the virus directly into the body, or in the case of RP, into the eye. One of the more mechanistic questions that as physicians and scientists we think about is, do you have to express whatever you're expressing, the protein uh, or delivering the DNA or the RNA, do you have to deliver it to one cell or many cells? And that has to do with how the protein does its work. So for example, if you're, miss you're trying to deliver something for, let's say, hemophilia, where you're missing a, a blood clotting factor, it may be that you just need to deliver the gene therapy to a small number of cells. It pumps out a ton of the clotting factor and it floats around the body. So that's what we call non-cell autonomous and therefore you don't need to hit a lot of cells. But if you're trying to treat, let's say, brain cells from degenerating, and in fact, the protein only works in the neuron, you might need to hit a lot of neurons or nerve cells. Again, how much do you need to make a ton of protein in a few cells or do you need to make normal amounts of protein in each cell? This is a, an important question. Do you need to regulate it? Because some proteins may be good and bad and you need just the right amount and then you need to control how you produce the protein. And the most importantly is toxicity because this is one of the main reasons therapies fail. What is the toxicity to the patient? Or in the case of gene therapy, often we focus on the host immune response. You know, the same reasons why you might not feel well with a vaccine your body mounts an immune response to any foreign material. And in the case of a vaccine, that's a good thing. But in the case of gene replacement therapy, that could be a bad thing. And increasingly with ed gene editing, we worry about genotoxicity. It's not just toxicity to the cells or the tissues of the body, but also is it actually toxic to our DNA, which can cause mutations, which in the context of aging can cause cancer. Here are some of the different um, gene um, uh, therapy uh, modalities. I've touched on them, so I won't underscore again uh, the issues. DNA can be very efficient, but um, uh, it can be quite uh, advantageous in terms of toxicity and simplicity, but they're not very efficient. It doesn't get into the cell very well. RNA can be more efficient, but again, it could be stable, have stability issues. Again, think about our COVID vaccine where you've got to store it at minus 70. Um, the viruses I touched on, adeno, adeno-associated, retro and lenti are examples of oncoretroviruses. Even herpes viruses have been developed because they go especially to the brain and to neurons. So there are many types of platforms that can be used. It's important when you think about 
again, location, 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 all these vectors, as we call them, have different um, um, positives and negatives. And there's not one simple answer. You have to understand the disease to pick the right, the right context. Um, examples of viral vectors, I've touched on this, adenovirus, have been very effectively used in cancer gene therapy. Um, actually, the very first approved gene therapy in the world was a cancer gene therapy in adenovirus um, that was approved in China. Uh, AAV, again, has been used now for the neurons in the spinal cord, in the uh, retina, in the liver, especially been used. And there are a lot of both approved, several approved drug trial, uh, approved drugs, as well as clinical trials in this area, which I'll touch on. Um, retroviruses have been very useful in lentiviruses, these oncoretroviruses, because they effectively infect blood cells. Um, the approved CAR T cell therapy takes advantage of this approach where you use immunotherapy, where you modify the T cell of the patient to target their own cancer. Um, similarly, um, these viruses have been used in stem cell therapy where you correct a blood stem cell and infuse the stem cell back into the body. One of the more exciting examples of that that some of you are probably familiar with is the treatment of sickle cell, where there it's a combination of not just gene therapy of a stem cell, but you even bring on the potential for gene editing. And then, as I mentioned, herpes simplex has been used to target brain tissues as well as examples of cancer. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these specific viruses? This is a virus that I've studied for many years, adenovirus. is a common cold virus. So it's great because you can make lots of it. It can infect lots of different cells. It's very efficient in getting DNA into cells and the gene you're interested in. And Importantly, it doesn't integrate. So there's very low levels of genotoxicity. We don't really know of examples that truly adenovirus caused the cancer. And it can take a lot of information, up to 36,000 base pairs. So you can fit one or more genes into adenovirus. The main problem, of course, is adenovirus is also is very immunogenic. And in fact, if you inject it into the bloodstream, the body makes a very big immune response. Um, in many forms of adenoviruses, they can be transient, meaning it doesn't give you long-term correction. There are examples of vectors or viruses like adenoviruses that can give long-term correction. We developed one of them here at Baylor called help with dependent adenovirus. But in general, they don't persist as long as some of the other vectors. As I mentioned, they can stimulate a strong immune response. And this is why some of the COVID vaccines, for example, use adenovirus. Um, and they can stimulate what's called the innate immune response. And this can be problematic. And also because a lot of folks can make antibodies against adenovirus or have seen, uh, seen an adenovirus before, it can limit the ability to administer or re-administer a potential treatment. Now, very commonly used now is AAV, which is a much smaller virus than adenovirus. And it's actually a helper virus of adenovirus. And it's generally thought to be not pathogenic, not to cause significant human disease. Um, one of the things, uh, that it, our advantage, it makes this advantageous is that there's a decreased host immune response. So it doesn't stimulate the toxicity that we see sometimes with adenovirus. And it can um, express for longer term because there isn't this strong immune response. And it also can infect many different types of tissues. The problem with that AV is that you can not produce a lot of it effectively. So if you're treating a few patients, then there's no question it's sufficient. But if you have a lot of patients there will be basically supply chain issues. Think about that in terms of you know, the current lingo. Also, the infectivity rate is it's not as infectious. And so if you have to infect a lot of cells, deliver the therapy to a big swath of organs, this can be a problem. Also, the cloning capacity, meaning that it can only hold small genes. So it turns out that you're trying to treat a genetic disease. That's a big gene. This is a problem. And irrespective of that it has a safer profile, we now know that even with AAV, it's still foreign DNA. At high enough doses, you can cause a toxicity. And as we now know, there've been several clinical trials where in fact, patients just like with adenovirus have unfortunately died with very, very high doses of AAV. So again, it's important to keep in mind, there is no magic bullet alone. You have to really match the treatment and the dose to the disease. Um, these integrating oncoretroviruses like um, HIV, they're, they can hold a little bit bigger DNA, so eight to nine kilobases. They integrate, and this is why they're useful for blood cells, because blood cells divide all the time. If they don't integrate into the DNA, once a blood cell divides, you lose the vector. This is why adenovirus and AAV don't well work for these blood cell type diseases. 
They don't stimulate a big host immune response and they can correct long-term. So it's really, really effective. And as I said, they're perfect for blood stem cells. The problem is the reason they're perfect for blood stem cells can also be an issue. They integrate into DNA and by chance, they can disrupt important genes that affect, for example, the growth of the cells, and which is why sometimes one can get blood cancers as a byproduct of the treatment. Also, um, they're not easy to produce. So again, for you know, a few patients in rare disease, it would be fine. It would be challenging from a supply perspective if you're trying to treat lots and lots of patients. And so again, there are these viruses have their strengths and their weaknesses, and they all fit certain applications. Now, one of the most exciting arenas now, as I alluded to, is in fact RNA therapy. We, most of us have a shot of RNA now in our arm. Well, again, RNA has been studied for decades, and it's decades of research that allowed us to make the COVID vaccine so quickly. RNA can be tackled in many ways. You can actually use an RNA, like a messenger RNA, to make the protein. So you're actually giving the messenger RNA, just like you sometimes give the DNA in a virus, to make the protein of interest. So this is gene replacement. And so you could imagine giving RNA to a rare disease that you're missing an enzyme, for example, in a urea cycle in the liver, and it may help to treat the urea cycle. But you can also use RNA to get rid of a protein. Remember, that's the other option. And that's what siRNA or microRNA therapies are, where these small nucleic acids can actually bind a target messenger RNA and degrade it. So if you have a protein that's, quote, bad, you can actually try to get rid of it. And then finally, finally you can also use a version of a DNA called ASO, allele-specific oligo, to do all sorts of tricks targeting a messenger RNA, not just to inhibit it, but you might be able to correct it especially when the messenger RNA is not processed. So there are specific examples where this can be done. Um, and and uh, 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 another example is in fact, spinal muscular uh, uh, atrophy and SMN, where this is an example. Finally, stem cell therapy. You know, stem cell therapy has been around for a long time. You're giving the cell back to the body. That's what a bone marrow transplantation is. It's just there, you're giving lots of different cell types. Um, fetal stem cell therapy, where in fact you're giving a, a, a stem cell into a fetus, and that actually has been tried in Europe. Adult stem cell therapy, where you take stem cells from an adult, it could be from different tissues, blood, fat, um, mesenchyme, and use that as a, a, a treatment. One of the challenges of stem cell therapy is identification, purification, and engrafting, especially engrafting. How do you get the stem cell to go where you want it to go, stick to that tissue, and really grow in that tissue. And so that these are some of the challenges. But at what we have seen, stem cell therapies are especially effective when combined with gene therapy. You take an individual's blood stem cell, which is missing a protein, use gene therapy to replace that protein and then put it back into the patient. That's perfect because there's very little risk of immune response to those cells because it comes from the patient. What we don't get away from still is depending upon the vector you use is that you can still get this idea of genotoxicity in terms of targeting unwanted areas of the DNA. When you step back and you look at how active gene therapy was when I was a trainee in the early 90s, you can see the beginning. And now the number of gene therapy trials have grown over this period of time um, that, that has been active and approved worldwide. These are trials that have been approved. If you look at the geographic distribution of where these gene therapy trials are, um, the vast majority are in America, but many are in Europe, Asia, but it gives you sort of a sense that it is really a therapy studied throughout the whole world. What about the kinds of diseases? No doubt cancer has been the top, close to 70% of trials have been focused on cancer, but rare monogenic diseases are a significant number. So about 12% at this reading, about 370, cardiovascular diseases, infectious diseases, neurological diseases, ocular diseases, inflammatory diseases, for example, or other examples of the target. But certainly cancer has been the majority of these trials. There are clinical uh, gene therapies and commercial development. And this is just a limited listing of some that um, uh, are already in, in, in different development and there are many more. So the point is that there's a lot of activity and investment in this front. Um, when we think about vectors, what types of vectors have been used? Uh, a lot have been adenovirus, 18%. Retroviruses, about 
the DNA, naked DNA, plasma DNA, about 15%. Lentiviruses or these oncoretroviruses are 10%. Adeno-associated viruses, 8%. So the point is that they're all being studied. And the reason, again, underscores is that every disease is different. There's a unique aspect of the disease, a location of the disease that will predicate what, what exactly we would optimally use in terms of gene therapy. And importantly, clinical phases. You know, where are we in the pipeline? The vast majority, over 50% are phase one. Is the therapy toxic? About a quarter are in phase one, two, trying to find a dose. About 16% clearly are looking to find a dose. And then finally, a, a smaller number, about 5% are actually at that phase three, meaning pivotal does the therapy work. And it gives you a sense of where we are, but that's a lot. Hundred, over 140 therapies already in, in phase three. Now, this is a slide that's complex. And the point I'm trying to make is that one of the major obstacles ultimately to all therapies, not only gene therapy, is the host immune response, but especially to gene therapy. And this is a slide that we published many years ago when we were focused on treating gene therapy, using gene therapy for hemophilia. And what we found was different viruses, in this case, adenoviruses, stimulated an innate immune response. This is an immune response where your body uses this to protect against all foreign materials. It's not necessarily specific to a protein or an antigen. Um, but really to all foreign materials. This is why we're able to think of it as a first line of defense. These types of immune responses can cause significant toxicity. And we think contribute to when a gene therapy fails for toxicity. Then there's the adaptive immune response. This is what happens when we get vaccinated. This is a slower response where you generate antibodies and cells that attack cells that carry that foreign material. And this also can happen. And so this will always be sort of the bane of those of us who are working on gene therapy and trying to avoid gene ther uh, the toxicity related to gene therapies. And in fact, it can lead to all sorts of effects. Um, even when it doesn't attack the cells and get rid of the cells that have been treated with gene therapy. This is a paper that we published many, many years ago, but shows that in fact, um, uh, whether a foreign protein or a protein that is used to replace um, what's missing, in this case, alpha-1 antitrypsin, is expressed in all cells versus only in target liver cells can mediate long-term expression because you avoid the host immune response. So there are many ways that we can try to trick the host immune response, and this is just one example. So again, I underscore this that there are ways to try to get around it. So this is, in fact, what gene therapists are trying to do in developing therapies. So when you look back and you think about what have been the milestones, well, when you think about the structure of DNA in 1953, it was elucidated, you know, by Watson, Crick, Wilkins, and Rosalind Franklin. This was critical because this was, in fact, the DNA structure. And you need to understand that before you can move forward. How does this, um, you know, encode proteins, the genetic code of DNA? How DNA encodes the 20 amino acids by Nuremberg and others? That was in the 60s. When you think about then the idea of genetic engineering, moving DNA, from one source into another and to replicate it. That really is the goal of gene therapy. How do you make more genetic material so it can encode for more protein? The seminal experiment of that was in 73, where this was done, in fact, in bacteria, taking DNA from a plasmid and replicating it in bacteria. And then accelerate to 1990, where really the sort of modern era of clinical gene therapy started, was the first ever gene therapy trial using a retrovirus to treat severe combined immunodeficiency with Michael Blaze and French Anderson at the NIH. And this was a very important milestone. And that prompted a response in terms of regulation. The FDA and NIH created mechanisms for monitoring gene therapy. This was also uh, uh, the time of an unfortunate event, which underscore the potential toxicity of therapy when Jesse Gelsinger died from an OTC gene therapy trial. Again, you know, patients unfortunately have suffered in the in clinical trials, certainly in the spectrum of cancer, but I think this underscored how sometimes we have to really be very systematic in looking at toxicity, especially of some of these vectors. Um, again, another milestone was uh, the correction of a patient with excellent severe combined immunodeficiency, where there seemed to be really clinical rescue, but then patients developed leukemia. This again underscored the idea of genotoxicity. 
that if you integrate into the host DNA, the patient's DNA, you can have unwanted side effects. But things began to turn around over that period of time. As I touched on, the first ever approved gene therapy in China was an adenovirus gene therapy. Um, another one in 2012 focused on treating a lipoprotein lipase deficiency uh, using AAV, one of the first ever AAV gene therapies in Europe. And then, of course, in 2017, um, really dramatic, where in the U.S., the FDA approved the first in vivo gene therapy for a form of retinal dystrophy using the AAV vector. And I would say this was a, certainly a milestone. This was um, from the um, SCID trial where I had touched on where it looked like there was great correction, but unfortunately, at the same time, patients developed um, a cancer of the blood because even though the vector delivered the missing protein or the missing gene into blood cells, it also integrated in areas which caused an expansion and eventually a development of cancer. So something we need to be alert for. Finally, gene editing. This is this important you know, Nobel Prize winning um, discovery where underscoring basic science is so critical. Without studying basic science, we would have never appreciated this because this is really nothing more but an immune system for bacteria. And you might ask, why would we ever care about the immune system in bacteria? Well, because they developed a technology which allowed us to actually target any piece of DNA, not just in bacteria, but in human cells very specifically. And importantly, introduce a break and then replace it with what we want. What we want. So this idea of gene editing. So the idea that if you have an A at a position and it, it, it destroys a, a code and the, the, the normal sequence is a G, we can actually replace the A with a G. And that's a very exciting opportunity. It brings into questions about things like, can we even treat diseases fetally? And this is an example of neuronopathic Gaucher disease in an animal model where fetal gene therapy was used to try to rescue it. So as we develop more and more of these effective therapy in the postnatal setting, the same questions will apply, can we treat in the fetus? Because some of these diseases affect the fetus and treating postnatally may be too, too late. And so these will be new, new opportunities. There, there are considerations uh, in fetal gene therapy. These cells grow very fast. So oftentimes you're gonna need vectors that can integrate. Then if you integrate, you can have genotoxicity. Um, will you tolerize the patient? Because a lot of times the, the fetus is an immunoprivileged site and it may be tolerogenic and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, is there an effect to maternal antibody or a side effect when you deliver these vectors systemically? Can they get through the placenta? And of course the ethical considerations, especially if the therapy seems to affect the DNA itself. So when you conclude, what have we learned about gene therapy and genetic disease? Um, I didn't cover this first point, but I think all of us are sensitive to the fact that you have to understand natural history of disease to really um, understand mechanism. And only the mechanism tells us about location, location, location. You know, what is the right vector? How much do we need to correct? Does it have to come out of the cell or stay out of the cell? Do we, do we replace, do we um, eliminate, or do we edit and correct? Um, there has to be good, great cooperation between the families and support groups uh, with industry and ultimately with investigators because all bring important things to the table to advance first the understanding of the disease to the proof of concept gene therapy, and then ultimately to make it a commercially available treatment. It's important to include the FDA because ultimately the FDA has to regulate these therapies. They have to opine and ultimately decide on how do we determine whether a therapy works? And this is the issue of what are the endpoints? How do you measure effectiveness? Is it clinical? Are there surrogates that could accelerate development and be acceptable? Because sometimes clinical endpoints may require so many patients that it doesn't make it feasible to do a phase three trial. The key question is effective index. And this is true for whether it's a gene therapy or a pill or any type of therapy. What is the effective dose versus what is the toxic dose? If the effective dose is 1,000 to 100,000 times bigger than the toxic dose, then even with the variation in the human population, it's likely to be safe. But if the effective dose is, let's say, only 10 times above the toxic dose, there will be individuals who, at that effective dose, may get a bad reaction. And as we know, all therapies have toxic effects. The question is how common and what's the risk-benefit 
assessment. Um, for gene therapies, especially, the patient's immune response will be critical, um, especially when we think about gene editing. Are there off target effects where you hit other parts of DNA? This is true for those viruses or vectors that integrate, just like retroviruses. There are always off target effects that we need to consider. So with that, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'll, I'll end and I'm happy to take any questions. I hope that that gave you a sense of all the excitement that's going on in gene therapy. There's enormous promise, um, but obviously we, we have to take it stepwise also. I think, you know, in looking back in 30 years of gene therapy, one of the, um, I would say mistakes in the early, late nineties was there was perhaps overhype and, and insufficient science. And I think, what we've done now is systematically really go do the science uh, and then deliver. So thank you and happy to take questions. Wonderful, Dr. Lee, thank you very much. That was a great presentation and a great way to begin our summit today. Um, we will now be open for questions. As a reminder, please place your, place your questions into the Q&A tab on the attendee website and they will then come to me and I will ask those questions of Dr. Lee. So we do already have a couple questions. Dr. Lee, the first question is, when comparing the types of gene therapy, you showed a slide with advantages and disadvantages. Toxicity was listed as an advantage. Can you explain why toxicity would be an advantage to a human treated with gene therapy? Yeah, that, that's a, just a, a misunderstanding uh, or, or shorthand on my part. So when I say toxicity as an advantage, it means actually reduce toxicity. So I should have actually put reduce toxicity. Obviously, increased toxicity would never be an advantage, uh, albeit with probably the exception of cancer gene therapy, where if its toxicity is just to the cancer cell, then that would be an advantage. But no, what I meant was that um, it was an advantage if there was a reduced toxicity. Um, so if it's an advantage, it's reduced toxicity. And, and that, that is the situation, for example, with AAV uh, at reasonable doses, not, not necessarily at the highest doses. And again, since you bring this point up, it's important for me to note that this is all relative, right? It's toxicity at a certain dose. And uh, I believe that if you go high enough with any of these therapies, and, just, and that's reasonable, with any drug, if you go high enough, you will get toxicity. So it's about this issue of the efficacious dose to the toxic dose. Very good, thank you. Okay, second question, um, it says, in your opinion, is there still a role for utilizing a recombinatorial approach to large gene delivery via AAVs? That is, a gene split in half and delivering two constructs calculating for recombination efficiency for greater, five, for greater than five KB genes. Is this too complex? The question's complex. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, let me give a little background to the question. So it's an excellent question. So, you know, just like you have a compact car, you have an SUV, and then you have a truck, right? These vectors all can carry different sizes of DNA. And um, this question is about AAV, which is probably one of the small, it's like a compact car. It can hold about 5,000 base pairs compared to an oncoretrovirus, which is about eight to 9,000 compared to an adenovirus, which is up to 38,000, which is like the truck. So if your disease gene is, let's say, 8KB, it's not going to fit in a compact car. It's like fitting six people in, in a, car, a compact car that can hold four. So what has been developed by scientists, a very ingenious way where you can actually give two AVs. So it's like put put four people in one car, two people in the other car. And somehow these two compact cars actually recombine when they're in a cell and actually make sort of a hybrid car that has six people in order. And, and that's been shown to work. I think the challenge there is, especially not from a proof of principle, there's no question from a proof of principle, it works. But remember, we're thinking about developing therapies that have to get to patients, which have to be produced. Supply chain, think of it that way, right? And I think that's really brought to practical experience what, what that means. It, it, again, could certainly be used, but I just see it as so complex that it's not going to be easily, you know, adapted to a situation where you have, might have to treat, you know, thousands of patients. Now, if you have to treat one patient, that may be a, a different scenario. But I would argue that if you only have to treat one patient, would that be the simplest solution? There may be other vectors that could achieve that. Very good. Uh, the next question, 
Would you say we have a fair system for allocating research dollars across all the conditions that might benefit from gene therapy? That's kind of a loaded question, I think. That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, that, of course, you know, I, I, I guess it depends on who you're asking, because I think the answer is always going to be no for everybody. <laughs> and, and the reason is, is there is no real, you know, simple way to address resource allocation. I think that there are a lot of rare diseases and, you know, I think we all want to try to treat all of them. And the NIH really, I think, you know, does a great job in trying to support the most meritorious science. But this is why I say there needs to be a, a collaboration of, of NIH and industry and families because, you know, NIH's role is not to necessarily get the therapy to every patient. It's to show what can work. In our system, it's really industry that then partners to move that forward. So I do think, you know, right now, certainly in our system, the way it is set up, there is great incentive for industry to move forward on these rare diseases. And I think that at least in the rare disease community, achieving incentives like that, like the Orphan Drug Act has been transformative. Um, obviously, long-term, we have to balance the cost of that and access, but certainly, um, you know, we have to deal with getting the therapy first and, and then perhaps then tackling the access and financial issues. Very good, okay. Question number four, could you mention a few specific gene therapy or diseases amendable to gene therapy that you are particularly excited to follow over the next few years? So I, I don't wanna mention any specific diseases, but I, can, I could give you the characteristics of diseases I think would be right there on the top. And, and I don't think it's rocket science. If you, if, you, if you heard what I said about location, 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 certainly diseases where you can target one area, I'll give you an example, the back of the eye, where you're kind of a restricted space, where you only have to deliver a certain, a small amount of vector to that area. I think those have, you know, just from an engineering perspective, is going to be easier. Um, something where you have to tackle every cell in the body, well, that's going to be tough, right? So I think that's sort of one potential area. You know, I think that if you have diseases where you have to correct um, a lot of cells early on, perhaps in the fetus, that's going to be, again, really tough, right? Just because not only the engineering issues, but the ethical issues and the, and the recruitment issues, that's, that's going to be challenging. I think, you know, from a biology perspective, even if you have to hit a disease that's not localized to an area, this issue of cell autonomy, if you have to just hit very few and pump out lots of protein that can fix the patient, that's gonna be easier than if you have to hit 100 cells and make the proteins in those, you know, that's stuck in those 100 cells. So there are a lot of these biological aspects. This is why, again, I underscore, underscore why it's so important to um, really understand the mechanism of disease. I would say if there's a disease where there's just one mutation, so that's another issue, right? With genetic disease, oftentimes there are many mutations which make it complicated, but let's say sickle cell as a good example, is one mutation. Well, that is really amenable to gene editing where you really just fix that one mutation. So, and we've already seen exciting results with sickle cell. So I think those are, again, from a gene therapy perspective, um, the types of things I would be excited and would be the quote, low hang fruits. So I, I have a question along those same lines. I think uh, concern is always longevity in these sorts of therapies too. And I don't think we know that answer yet, but uh, what's your perspective, say looking at gene therapy, if we give it today, will it last five, 10, 15, 20 years? Any perspective on that? Sure, I think the best data are that one can predict are the non-human primate studies that have been done. You know, if you inject a AAV into, an, into a non-human primate liver, or if you inject the helper-dependent antivirus into that liver, or if you use a retrovirus to in integrate into blood cells and then allow it to repopulate. I would say that for the, the vectors which are non-integrating, meaning they don't put themselves into the DNA of the target cell, if the cell doesn't turn over quickly, and a good example of that is like the liver, you know, in a, in a generally healthy liver, you know, we've seen therapies last for you know, five, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. So, you know, that's the limit of our experience in that scenario. So again, whether the cell 
divides and grows will be important. So for example, if you were to do liver gene therapy with A to B in a neonate with a liver in a baby where the liver is growing and growing and growing, well, you're going to lose that pretty quick as opposed to let's say an adult where the liver is now grown and it turns over maybe 1% a year, you inject into that liver, well, it may sit around for, for quite a few years. Now, if you're dealing with an integrating therapy, in theory, an integrating therapy like oncoretroviruses into a blood cell to treat immunodeficiency, in theory, if it engrafts, just like a bone marrow transplantation engrafts, it would be potentially lifelong. You know, there the ma major concern if you have efficacy is does it integrate in a, also in places which can stimulate the growth of those cells, which can cause blood cancer. So again, you know, that's the balance. But I think that for integrating therapies, in theory, it could be lifelong. Interesting. Cool. All right. So we have one more question, and then we'll probably have to call it, uh, call it into the Q&A session. But it question goes as, uh, at a recent talk about the lentiviral-based gene therapy for cystinosis, I was surprised to hear that at least one participant had shown signs of GBHD. Is this really a risk when editing patients' own cells? Yeah, I have to say, I apologize. I don't know the specifics of that result, so I don't want to speak to it. I mean, in theory, if you're editing a patient's own cells, you really shouldn't have graft versus host. Now, what I would say is the following. Um, it, it's possible that, and this was always a concern in gene therapy, and again, I don't know if this was the basis of the cystinosis trial, um, that if you produce a protein that you have never seen in your body, so for example, this idea of a crim negative or you're missing protein X and you don't make it at all. If you give back protein X, that could be viewed in the right immune context as a foreign protein. And, and this is why I showed that slide about the alpha-1 antitrypsin that we published so long ago, but was a very key experiment because it showed that alpha-1 antitrypsin, which the, is, is seen in that mouse, that was a mouse. If you express it in the wrong cell types, you can get an immune response. And so even quote, good proteins, mm -hmm if you've never seen it, could cause an immune response. And in a way, um, you know, this is the challenge. The immune response of the body can overreact, and this is the basis of autoimmune disease. So I don't know if that was the issue with the cystinosis trial, but I, I, I could say that could be one issue. Um, and, and again, the immune response is so complicated, which is why I showed that immune response slide, because it's even more complicated than that. A lot of things can happen that we can't predict. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. That was fantastic. Um, and this now ends our first session.